Um, it's quite an interesting name, and most people ask me, is it designed? Um, funny thing is, it is designed, but not by me. One was by my parents, which is Heifer, which is real, and Porky, which is from my brother, which decided to make my life at school a nightmare. <laughs> but I think it was my first task as a, as a, as a, a problem solver, to how do you turn something that's so negative and destroys your, your sort of social life at school, and your woman didn't really weren't interested in Porky, you know, to turn it into a positive. And I'm so happy to be in marketing and to be in this sort of an, a, a, like environment where finally my name can work for me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there's many people in this room and I can go into a lot of black African names, I can go into a lot of Israeli names and stuff like that. I've never seen sick behind anyone's name in an article. <laughs> I'm getting used to it. <laughs> I'm starting to realize that it is quite a unique name. Um, it does change with people's perceptions of me and what I'm doing at the time. After Mavericks, they call me Porky Hefner. I'm not an expert. I've been in this industry, or my industry, which is all of your industries together, for three years only. I don't have a lot of expertise. I don't know much. But what I know is from what I've done. These words aren't going to change the world. But I wanna, what I want them to do is to inspire you to get up and change. I used to be in advertising. I was there for 16 years, and I realized I was rotting. My favorite piece of work over that time has to be the Nando's campaign that I was very fortunate to work with Josie McKenzie again on another Nando's project, and she was an incredible client. Incredible clients are something which continually go through my work. You have to have someone that has the belief in you and the trust in you to go that extra step and to spend a hell of a lot of money on you too. Lawrence Hamburger, you were incredible. Slade Gill, you were incredible. I realized what I'd done. I'd shifted my, my comfort zone from something where I was so confident and sitting in an office where, okay, clients were a nightmare, but anyway. We needed clients more than they needed us. The respect for the creative was lost. The money of the client became the imp important thing. Clients started buggering us around, and they started choosing the wrong work. They started maintaining the status quo of brands rather than growing a brand into an area where you could get growth or get change. The other problem that I saw in every day, the intellectual property that was thrown away by minor people, for a political reason or a personal reason, that was bullshit. The amount of, the amount of ideas. <laughs> so what I want you to do is get your little book that you've written all your little ideas in, and I want you to go into that real world, and I want you to make all those ideas that make you weird in the stomach. Because you know what? It's possible. I got out of advertising and in 2007. Well, it's uh, in 2007, I sat around there, I got out of my desk, after, out of my seat after a certain speech. I walked out of there and I gave up advertising. I realized I was doing absolutely nothing. Um, I started Animal Farm for certain reasons, structural and economic, from the last few years. I had to change and I now operate as myself as Porky Heifer. Quite an interesting thing from coming from New York, from 2,500 people, I've slowly worked myself down into myself. And I think, you know what, the one thing I can be proud of is that I'm doing what I really believe in and what I really think is a great idea. I'm not a product designer. I'm, I'm, I'm a brand interventionist. I'm not a strategic thinker. I am. I've been blessed with a strategic head. But the problem with strategic thinker is that dude doesn't do. And I want to be known as a creative doer of a strategic thought. The biggest problem, how many people are on your iPads, iPhone, there's lady writing, lady talking, lady thinking, thinking about problems, thinking about lunch, thinking about expert, nobody's listening. <laughs> no, but they're not. I mean, you know that. When you're talking to someone, you're looking at the person's eyes and they're thinking what they're going to say to you, that next clever little comment they're going to do. Shut up, man. Listen, for once. <laughs> and the easy way to do that is to demonstrate and not describe, because they're not listening to you. This was the interesting thing with lighting systems, which came out, and everyone talks about LEDs and CFLs are going to save the world, and we're going like, huh? And then you go and you buy an LED, and it's like 200 bucks. You go, not. <laughs> You're back in there buying that huge box of those little dodgy ones. I bought one for five rand the other day. I had to, I'm sorry. But I looked at that and I thought that was like a complicated message for people to say, and I go, what the fuck? What do I care about what you're saying? That's someone trying to sell me a light bulb. It's not someone trying to save the world. Look at what's happened in the past few years with electricity. So I just I wanted to get into it and distill it and see where the origin of that thought, where a consumer or a, or a person who's doing it would actually come to the cold face of this idea and interact with it in a, in a 
in a way that they would understand, as opposed to some bloody company's bottom line and making some huge money somewhere else in some other country. So less damage to the was elect less electricity, less energy, less heat. So these bulbs give off less heat. So for the first time, you could have a wooden light because the, 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 the incandescent light burns to, at such a high temperature that the transfer goes onto the wood and it will burn. But first thing, it won't even do that. It's going to malfunction. You've also got all those breathing holes in the back of your light. That's also another bullshit thing. Man. The idea is that it's not designed about you. It's designed about what you can get. So there are no stains or anything in, in, in these lights. I will choose you the tone of the wood that is suitable to the tone that you require in your lovely new house. Usually sold as, um, and hung as pendants, tried to sell as many as possible. This nice person in Plettenberg Bay bought lots of them. <laughs> but it looks better the more they are. Um, and everyone says, I need 16 because LEDs are really dull. <laughs> Jeez, I don't know what that like, food looks like, but it's pretty bright. <laughs> I moved on from the light um, and started simplifying it even further, which was to sh simple shapes that we found around us in the world and stuff. And they just, they literally are the shapes that I just see. I take a photograph and I turn it into light. Um, this is the first series of found objects. And I just want you to keep looking around. Look at those things. Keep your eyes open. Turn iPad, iPhone, off, off, off. Look. And start getting involved with yourself and how you're interacting with these things and how you think about it. And you get that weird feeling. You go, fuck, I've got a great idea. It is a great idea. Make it. And the very important thing is keep it simple. Because the simpler your idea, the bigger your universe. The more complicated, the more, more niche. Let's leave that to art. We're in design and we're in something which is about involving people and helping people. I'm trying to take that further. And this is my new light which is coming out this year. Which is just a total breakdown and total simplification of shapes. It started from children's toys where you put it in a little hole. And then my wife brought me a book which was Bauhaus. And those are the same shapes for Bauhaus. So that was such an interesting connection to come to, but from two very different places. And a guy that wakes up one day and says, I'm going to make a living out of making ideas. And look at my first product that's keeping me alive. My wife and I made a decision to not have children. I do have an older child, but I don't have children. I don't have a lot of the stresses that you guys are sitting here doing, going, how am I going to pick up my kid for lunch? But what it's given me the ability to do is to be a child. And when I have those crazy ideas and I say things, which most of you say, no, I'm going home, um, I carry on and I do it. And I'm just saying that the last time you were, a, you were a person that believed in what you thought and thought, hey, why don't we do that? Well, I want to be a spaceman, was when you were a child. Go back. But we also get the ability. I'm also allowed to climb 10 meter ladders and use power tools without adult supervision. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes my wife wants to come to me on my, 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 uh, my installations of things, and I, I don't let her because I think if she had to know what I'm doing up there, she wouldn't let me go. <laughs> the hardest part of a design is the brief. How do you come up with an idea when you're just sitting there going, shit, I've got so many ideas? So Southern Guild and the Joburg Art Fair featured a couple of times in their presentation. It's a reason to do something. It's a reason to be brave. You can hardly fail. Well, we have. These were my first drawings, and I was confirmed to be on drugs. <laughs> it's based on the, the weaver's nest. I'll explain things there later. But that's the result of the first job. <laughs> because I'm an ideas man, and my hands don't really function that well in these different sort of specific, like, things that these guys out there do, they like sort of engineers, architects, I don't know anything like that. But I've got an idea which I can hopefully provide inspiration to get the right collaborators to do it. Mariki Baez was the wonderful lady from heaven sent to help me because I've got to tell you, the faces that I spoke to before hers were, geez, there were a lot of them and they're all just like... <laughs> there, you climb up the ladder, you slide the door closed, um, you put a a cushion in and you're totally sealed off. The idea was for game reserves, but I think there are a couple of game reserves sitting here, hopefully. You've all said no. Um, I'm looking for a game reserve with balls. <laughs> I simplified. The last one had too many, product, um, too many materials. So I got, went totally simplified, and this is totally with Port Jackson. So working with an alien bark, which we then strip and then we wrap around a, a, a metal frame. This is the installation. Again, brilliant client, Anna Marie Ferreira. Thank you. The idea there being that there is no human intervention. You can't see the chain. So most of the people go there and look, look at it. But that sees about 50 kids a day in its life. Jumping on it, weekends, much more. And it's still looking like that. That's four years old, three years old. 
I changed to a totally natural frame, going with Kubu Kane. I worked firstly with the Cape Town Society of the Blind. I always believe in uplifting people. I have a lot of recovered alcoholics, drug addicts. They're not my family, they're my people who work for me. <laughs> um, these are the guys from the Cape Town Society of the Blind. Um, I started with the quite scary rope ladder. It's different shapes, different sizes, different smalls, all relating to the, the environment that they're in. These were all sort of built without me understanding the environment. The big change started happening when I started finding the rich people in Cape Town. And had the opportunity, this is like three houses from my house, which is amazing, I could go there. So I could study the location, and my drawings, I draw like crazy. It's through drawing that I actually find my form. But also when you're trying to explain something that doesn't exist in the world, the only way you can do it is by showing somebody. If you spec that, they're going to say I'm on drugs again. And then I use the Dogon ladder, you can see, which is a far more stable system to get up in there. That's a, a meditation pit in a friend of mine's garden. I use a pen. <laughs> it's only through the use of a pen that you can get to know yourself. And as Heinrich said, those mistakes that come up that you start seeing, you go like, wow, that's amazing. So I started doing things from up. There's no tree involved. Everyone said, I don't have a tree. <laughs> so... It's really hard when someone orders a weaver's nest and he doesn't have a tree. Is there? <laughs> you walk around the garden like sort of like <laughs> strong, like uh, something. But it's true that you make your mistakes. You make your mistakes on paper. And by the time you give it to somebody else, it looks cool. And if you draw it enough, the product will be exactly the same as you draw. Because you will be attaining, you're going towards a certain thing. And that's how they look today at Babylon's tour and Karen, thank you for the opportunity. This is in a, in a bird watching area. It's only for one person each. There's a cushion and then you climb in and you paint the birds. We've got all, these, all the plants that are paint, planted around there are seed bearing plants. So the birds come and you sit in there and you're totally immersed in the environment. Then I went crazy. Um, <laughs> through drawing, late at night, going, fuck, this is a good idea. Why don't we have this? And then my wife says, why don't you do a slide? And I was like, fuck, that's a cool idea. It wasn't such a cool idea, but it worked. The client bought it, amazing client again, Dean Kowarski, and Bruce Bayer, a fantastic landscape artist who is now incorporating my work into his garden because what we do is we get the kids on here, in there, and then into the garden. They can't go up the slide. <laughs> so this is without a cushion. These pictures were taken yesterday during my lunch break. Um, I was trying to get the installation finished, but it hasn't. That's the slide, so you pop down that slide, and then the second picture underneath is where you land. There's a cushion there, don't worry. And then that's the adult's one, where the adult walks off the, the balcony into the nest. And you know what? Even though that slide was a nightmare, I want every one of you here, especially architects, every product you do, every job you do, do something new. Do something that pushes you and pushes the people that view that building. Heinrich, your, your airflow system and stuff, incredible, incredible. But don't ever stop evolving, otherwise you're just going to be going like this. Don't do that. So there's lots more ways to go. And, you know, these actually, there's a bigger design in here. It's for a lodge. Um, again, game reserves with kahunas. Um, <laughs> phone me. You know the story about the male and the female weaver bird where the female pulls down the nest? Huh? I've made 11 nests. My wife hasn't pulled down a single one. So I love you. <laughs> Without the support of, the cra of you know, listening to the crazy, I don't think she listens anymore, she just says yes. Um, yeah, I wouldn't be able to do it without you. Thank you, Yelda. I worked on Coke for a very long time. Their brief was, how do we make Coke eco? I said, you stop doing Coke. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that was in Atlanta. <laughs> it was like, oh, shit. So they, said, they shat on me. I said, no, but you can't, because all the information you've given me is un-eco-friendly. So I can't bullshit. Like the guy said earlier, what's the, what's the truth of the story? So I did the logos for a while. Um, if you look on any can around the world, you've got a little logo. They did redesign them for three years, but they didn't manage to get far away enough from me. But anyway, so you'll still notice my logo. Um, but through the system of this, I, was, I got thinking. I mean, I drew those things. Jeez, I can't tell you how many times I was just going around. But kids have been recycling for centuries. We're always trying to get our kids into recycled toys. Lego is the ultimate recycled toy. Um, that picture with the guy sitting there actually was the inspiration for this idea. And that's where Crate Fan was born. Um, Elliot and Opa. The name Elliot and Opa. Uh, everyone was saying, what's the name? What's the name? What's the name? I was like, oh, shit, I don't know. But every day, like uh, that, that standing one is in Joburg. That was Opa. I was standing in front of this going, Opa! Looking for the manager. And I'm standing in front of this guy going, Opa! <laughs> and I realized that was quite strange. But just calling it Opa, giving the recognition of the guy who was the manager of the site. 
really turned things around and they started working very late into the night after that. <laughs> Tactical. And then Elliot is in Cape Town. There's Elliot actually standing there eating his Kentucky Fried Chicken, having a chill. The whole idea here being that, you know, the system is a continuous system. There are two continuous systems, one being the scaffolding system, the other one being the co crate system. So everything's doing their own thing. One's in a building, one's on a truck or something. I borrow them for a while, I make a message, and I take it down, and there's zero waste. The idea was to come up all over the world when you think, did that travel? And you go, no, the idea just traveled. We just used the local systems that came up. So you, you're helping the ecology. Here. <laughs> and then I had this dull guy sitting there for a while, and I was going, shit, I'm not doing the Lego, I'm not doing the Lego. And then I did some Christmas, but um, I did a self-portrait, and they thought it was Father Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> and then I did Nice Puerto for Easter. Great fans, very photogenic, and there were some beautiful pictures, and, you know, I think I helped a couple of people for two years' time. So photogenic, but the most important pictures were these pictures, and over a thousand photos taken a day has been up there for two and a half years and sent around the world. This is another project which I just did, which is just working with how do you, we've got all this information on the, on the internet. Does it ever realize in anything except some bullshit comment or some retweet or some crap? So I was like, how can I, how can I take it and physically me, with my own knowledge and own creativity, put something in? And that was just all this session of infographics we're about to dive into in the world. Huh? So those are three t two tables, that again, Southern Guild. This is, my th this is the, the theme of my talk, which is just trust your gut. I mean, honestly, when I get a funny feeling, when I get a nice idea, and all the ideas that I've shown you, it was that. And you sort of get that weird thing. That's the one. Just do it. I thought that was very funny. <laughs> You know, it actually means something even more because I go, the porky heifer, when I put myself there, I'm saying, porky heifer, you yourself, do what you were put on this earth to do and do what's inside you. So just do it. That funny idea, just do it. I was sitting on a beach and this dog runs past me from the water and I th look, looked and I turned to my friend and I said, I think that dog had human teeth. <laughs> the drug thing came up again. <laughs> I was like, think about it, like, but that was weird. So I designed this ball, <laughs> and I thought there must be a way to do this. Huh? <laughs> Rogs is, is our biggest pet, uh, pet accessory distributor, and they, they said, no, no, we don't take other ideas, we've been doing this for 10 years, no, no. <laughs> Shit, I'm glad they did it, because we've been in development for two years. And we've only just got it right now, and it's going to be launching in the very soon, and it's got worldwide distribution, and that's great. I need open minds now. I need no morals. <laughs> I need no judgment. <laughs> I got a phone call from a guy, and he said, F uh, excuse my language, I don't swear usually. Um, <laughs> he said, fuck, I believe in you, man. You're the man. You're going to change my product. Huh? I was like, this is what I've been waiting to hear. I was like, yes. I can help you. So I said, who are you? He said, I'm Shane Harrison from Maverick. So, <laughs> so I was like, okay, give the guy a chance. By the way, I'm the only man in South Africa to ever turn down a VIP pass. So I'll give you two cards. So his problem was a category problem. And he said that wherever he puts his work, they say, no, you can't, do, you can't advertise a strip bar there. No, you can't advertise a strip bar there. No, you can't advertise it. So I was like, okay, so how do you advertise a strip bar? Where can you go to? What are the ways to do it? So what I did was I studied, now we're in categories of strip bars being illegal, whatever, not illegal, um, problematic. There was actually a title, I left the rocks for dogs on there by mistake this morning, and it's gone, but that was quite funny. <laughs> um, so what I did was I studied categories, and I said, who gets away with murder? So I went through a, lot, a nice couple of glossy porn mags, and I, then I moved into sort of GQ and stuff, but I realized fragrance advertising. It's all over the place, and we've got a boob there, and we've got a little this there, but it, because it's Jennifer, it's fine. So what I said to him is, like, would he be interested in sort of diversifying a bit and sort of growing a line of it? Maybe we can find an angle there which will still have the relevance for your brand. So I invented the range of perfumes called alibis. The alibis being like you sort of always think there's something going to happen, but nothing happens. So you just stay there for one more dop and still nothing happens. But you're quite late now. <laughs> and you've got to explain why nothing happened and you're really late. So I thought I'd help the guys and give them a bit of an alibi so that they could come home and get to sleep. So I produced three billboards. Um, 
the one, one alibi is my car broke down. This alibi smells of car oil, grease, and diesel. <laughs> but wait, it does exist. I did make a perfume, okay? Unfortunately, they're not such good perfume. <laughs> but they do smell of what I say they do, but I don't know if anyone would kiss you after that. I think your wife might kick you out of bed now because you stink. <laughs> so there were three. We were out sailing, which smelled of sea air, cotton rope, and sunscreen. Coffee, cigarettes, ink toner, and a wool suit. It got in a bit of trouble. And I was told to pull down my billboards because I had not thought of women. But I realized, you know what? I was being horrible to women. I didn't give them the opportunity, so I turned it into a unisex fragrance. <laughs> and all the charges were dropped. I just want to say pigeonholes and silos are something that we've lived with for a very long time. And I think it gives people a lot of security because they can label you and they can do things with you or they can say, oh, oh he's not an architect. The problem with the silo is if you go up, you're going to get a little bit lonely. And you start thinking, oh, but that's not architecture. That's not, that's not this, that's not that. And you start affecting the way that you're thinking as opposed to following that gut. It was big, skinny now. So rather than thinking in silos, think in quantums. Don't think in disciplines. Because you might kill your idea when you think, oh, no, I can't do that. I work for Coca-Cola. Do it. Do it. So start thinking in quantum. And you promise, when you get up there, you won't be alone. You'll turn around and you'll start finding other people in other industries that are thinking exactly the same way as you and a client that's willing to pay. So I want you to stop working and I want you to start living. Thank you.